the Guardians have added three very talented players. One of them uh, completely tormented the other one in a game this year, so that's going to be something fun to talk about. We'll talk about the craziness of this draft, because it was a ridiculous draft. Then from there, we're going to talk about the three additions, Parker Mezik, Justin Gamble, and Chase DeLotter to the Guardian system, where they slot in, what their upside is, what their ceiling is, what the concerns are, all on today's episode of Locked On Guardians. <laughs> You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This, today's episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. Make your moment sparkle with joy from BlueNile.com. And going on now is Blue Nile Anniversary Sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Shop, shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. So if you've been following, uh, my name is Jeff Ellis. I'm the host of Lockdown Guardians. Before that, I was a lead draft and prospect analyst over at 24-7 and Scout. I was doing mock draft videos for pick 1 to 61 uh, <laughs> up till 4 in the morning yesterday. Got about four hours of sleep, turned it around. Uh, let's see, if you're curious, it's it's midnight my time uh, as I'm working on this. But this is fun. This is my time of year. It's not quite Christmas because there's also a degree of cutthroat stress and you feeling like you have to perform. But it is a fun time in the end. And how did I perform, you might wonder? Well, hey, I got Justin Campbell right. I got one of the Guardians picks right. And if you listen to these podcasts, while my final mock did not have Chase louder there, I mean, you have mock evidence of my crossover with Lindsay where I predicted him to the Guardians. He was always a player that I thought was very much in play. So for this, I got those right. I ended up getting five total. I'll take it. Uh, my big board, there's only two players left. I've never had my big board this picked over. There's Brock Porter, who, I mean, I don't know. The Rangers, we'll get into what happened there. Uh, Brock Porter might be heading to school. And then Trey Dombrowski and Monmouth, who could still be a very much a Guardians target in the third round if he lasts just keep your eyes there and uh, maybe if there's time i'll explain why he's a guardians target but yeah that's a name to know so this draft got off from the beginning with craziness because you know listen you i pay attention to vegas because vegas has been very good figuring out who is going to go where because it money's on the line and when there's money on the line people go the extra mile vegas within a 48 hour period switched that who was going to be the top over overall pick three separate times and then it wasn't any of those players uh they were just completely just throwing things out there and ends up being jackson holiday and you know the reason is simple it's what i talked about on the show many times with every third trade or between the gar garials nope not the garials the guardians and the orioles is they don't have any real shortstops gunner hansen's a third baseman or henderson gunner hansen um was a leather face gunner henderson is uh, a third baseman and he's a fantastic player and you know i had him as a first round grade coming out of high school so i think he's gonna be a great player but he's a third baseman they got a true shortstop they got one of the few no doubters in this class at that position and it's gonna cost them this isn't a, a cheap signing the two highest bonuses he might be a little bit less than drew jones but it's not by much both those top picks are reportedly going to cost over eight million dollars to sign I mean, I thought there was a chance Holiday goes to school. Like, if you had asked me who's the player in the top 10 most likely to get to school, I'd have said him. But it didn't happen. I understand the selection. And, you know, all things being equal, they took positional value. And I can't fault them. Shortstops are the quarterback of the MLB draft. They rise. They got their quarterback. After that, Drew Jones, chalk. <laughs> then everything out the window. Kumar Rocker 3 was shocking. Nobody had that. That is the point where you go, what? <laughs> like, I, because here's the thing. Healthy Kumar Rocker, who's a year younger. Remember, he's like a senior now, which means he's an older... Rel you're losing that whole year of development. He had shoulder surgery. The Rangers did get to see his medicals. So there's that. They have that benefit there. Would He's not... If he was just Kumar Rocker of a year ago, if you could take that guy, transport here, and have no medical issues at all, he's not third on my board. He's not... And now they are saving $2 million. Are they going to, can they afford Brock Porter? Can they bring, maybe, maybe it's Tristan Smith. Maybe it's Jordan Taylor. Maybe it's Gavin Turley, uh, Brady Neal, the catcher. There's someone they're going to grab in, in round three with that uh, 84th overall pick. Keep your eyes on that pick. It's going to be something fun. But I don't like that pick at all. I don't. It, I think you could have saved $2 million and taken 
uh, you know, any of those, you could have grabbed someone from that top group. And if not that top group, uh, there's players to get. I, that was a crazy pick. And then from there, it's not like, you know, the next few picks were interesting. And by the way, Kumar, Kumar, Kumar Rockers, your first college player off the board. Then you got the four high schoolers around them. I'm still disappointed. I was so close, so close to having like my way too early mock have three picks that I got right in December. Like some of those could have really lined up. Just unfortunate for me there. <laughs> and then we had eight straight college players. Eight straight. Uh, for the worst pitching class in my 14 years of doing drafts that I have ever seen. Worst college pitching class. Three in the top ten. Same as a year ago in the deepest pitching class I had ever seen. Uh, I don't think anyone predicted. predicted? I, that's predicted and uh, projected. Made one word. Cade Horton, a, that that's a big leap of faith. It is interesting because he's a six-one righty. He's an undersized right-hander, and he was mostly a third baseman. But you like what you saw in a very limited sample, and they popped him there. Now they came back and got a very expensive player in round two, so that Cade Horton might be under slot. Like I heard, he wanted four to five million. Slot there is five point seven one. Jackson Ferris in round two, though. I mean, the Ferris rumor take was two to three million, closer to the three end of it. And that draft pick there. So maybe Horton is, is a lot of underslot. I, if you looked at my mocks, I projected them to take an underslot player there. I just didn't think Horton would be that far under slot. Uh, Brooks Lee is just, I mean, the, the Twins fell into Brooks Lee and Connor Prelip. They're, they're not going to come up as one of the best drafts, but they absolutely should. The Mets are my favorite, but like the Twins are very, very close. Uh, just, I mean, top talent was just sitting there for them. And they're just like, okay. Listen, I'm not a big Gavin Cross guy. I've explained many times. I don't think he's that safe. He is. He's a tweener to me. Uh, Gabriel Hughes, no one had in the top 10. Uh, not to say he's a bad pick, but it's an interesting selection there. But that pushed stuff down. And the, I mean, the Mets had two of my top 10 players. The Tigers did really well in here. Uh, Padres got three really interesting pitchers. Uh, the Reds getting Cam Collier was just a steal. Very clearly, the they had what I like to say, you know, a float deal in, which was he refused... You know, someone would be like, would you take this? No. And teams don't want to risk high picks on a player just to draft him and say no, like what happened with Judd Fabian a year ago, right? He had a deal in place with Baltimore, who finally got him this year. Uh, but Boston said, here, we'll offer you this. He's like, that's not what I want. And they're like, well, you can take it or you can go back to school. And he chose to go back to school. No one was willing to call the bluff on Cam Collier. So he, the Reds had a lot of picks, and they used that picks. They used those picks, and they used that pool to manipulate things a bit and get a top-10 talent. For the Guardians, you know, I it was funny because before the draft, I said, who are, you know, someone's like, who are the guys that you think could slide? And I called Cam Collier and Jace Jung. And, I mean, they both to a degree did, but uh, the Guardians didn't end up with either of them. They ended up with Chase DeLotter, and we'll talk about him. But what's fun about the one, they, they actually have a weird history of recent years of drafting guys from James Madison University. He's about the fourth one. Two, well, we'll get into more of the specifics, but if you listen to this podcast, and I'm sorry, to James, this is a brag moment, so just mute me, okay? Just mute me. Because not only did I get Justin Campbell right in my mock, I didn't get the lotter. But if you've listened to this podcast, you know how many times have I associated him to the Guardians. If you listen to this podcast, you already knew who he was on draft day. So, I, I mean, I don't know if anyone watches the Major League Baseball draft of friends. That doesn't really, I mean, maybe me and my friends, but it'd be a weird, not even with my friends. But uh, not a lot of people do it. But hey, you were loaded on information about this outfielder from James Madison. We're going to take our first break right here, come back, talk about the Lauder, talk about Campbell, talk about Messick. It's an interesting draft class, very much in a few different ways fits what the Guardians do. And, uh, you know, for an already deep system, they just got three more interesting players. Make your moments sparkle with BlueNile.com. Blue Nile makes amazing, interesting ideas. It, well, jewelry, not ideas, but what they come up with with their ideas is amazing, one-of-a-kind jewelry. They do wedding jewelry, they do fine jewelry, but it's never going to be something where what you give the person you love, you're then going to see on someone else. It is one-of-a-kind for you. You want it, and, and they have 24-hour support. Everything is personalized to you. You pick everything. They're going to also help you, but this is something you pick, you make. It is an original piece for the person that you love. And it doesn't matter if it's engagements or fine jewelry. They're there to support you and help you find that special forever piece. 
Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile anniversary sale. Save up to 40%. That's right, 40%. That's a huge amount. It's, I think, our biggest savings ever, 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. By the way, did you know they were the original online jeweler? So you're also getting the people who originated online jewelry doing fantastic pieces. Speaking of fantastic pieces, Chase DeLotter is a fantastic everything. Uh, so he was the number three rated player left on my board. Uh, he was 12th overall on my board. Uh, Cam Collier was the top. Drew Gilbert, who, listen, he's Drew Gilbert is just slept on. I mean, the Astros got, Astros had a, another killer. Like, if I'm saying my favorite drafts, it's, it's Mets, Astros, Twins. Like, that's that's where it is right now. Top of my head, Mets, Astros, Twins. So DeLotter, if you go back to when I did my way too early mock, um, which I didn't end up getting any picks on. I know. I was. Oh, it's just so close. That's going to eat at me. Yeah, oh, I will say, in fairness to myself, my way too early mock, uh, I did say as the sleeper to the Pirates, Tamar Johnson. So I had some, like, I had kind of some things in there. But where did Chase DeLotter go? By the way, DeLotter was my sleeper at one. And I ended up having him be the... Really? the Okay, I had him going down a little bit further than I anticipated. I had him going 13 to the Angels, so about where it is here. But I said he could go much higher. Uh, and the here's the thing. DeLotter is huge. Like He's a well-built, strong dude. Led the Cape Cod in home runs. Didn't strike out. Uh, that much like you know he he struck out but he wasn't someone who struck out a high rate for a power hitter he had low strikeout rates for a power hitter and that's been consistent both in the cape and at james madison now the problem's been health uh you know 2020 covid 2021 he had just 26 games just 24 games this year so he just hasn't played that much but you know what his batting line is in those three years at james madison 256 at bats over 66 games well you think again though most players get that in one season uh, James Madison also it wasn't just health with him. I believe it was like a minor health issue. And then James Madison also didn't play all of 2021 due to COVID uh, issues as well. But he ended up with a 402 batting average, a 520 on base, a 715 slugging, a 1.235 OPS, and 15 home runs. All great numbers. His bat pips through the roof. This year, a 508. Remember, what we talked about bat pip is the best indicator of uh, potential hit success. And a lot of people are like, oh, great. We drafted Bradley Zimmer because he's another big white outfielder. No. So Bradley Zimmer, when he was at uh, the University of San Francisco, he was a Don, uh, struck out a lot. You know, it, nowadays, if I knew the, the importance of strikeout percentage, uh, he would not have been a first round graded player for me. At the University of San Francisco, he struck uh, well, I guess he didn't strike out that much. For some reason, I thought he was a lot higher than that. Um, am I looking at the right guy? Uh, he was at 18, 12, and 13. Those aren't bad. So I don't know where I got that data. He didn't hit a lot of home runs. Uh, then he got to the minors, and really the free swinging became an issue. And that's the thing to look for. Like, I mean, he got to the minute he hit A ball, it started getting over 20. Uh, and as he moved up, I mean, one of the things that really prevented him from being success, successful in the majors is the walk rate didn't go up. Now, walk rate is one of those things that's kind of fluky. It's not a great indicator. It doesn't stick around. I swore. I, I said a whole narrative around Brad, uh, Bradley Zimmer striking out a ton, but he didn't. Um, that's weird. So when you look at the ladder, I guess there is some room for Bradley Zimmer comps. Uh, small school guys, the numbers aren't dissimilar. Uh yeah, but Delauder's a better athlete. Delauder's only 20 years old. Uh, he also has the Cape success, which Bradley Zimmer, when he went to the Cape, that's he was average. Uh, and at the Cape, he struck out a lot, and he didn't walk at all. So you go and you look at what he did in the Cape, uh, and with he was okay with Team USA. He wasn't great. The Cape, he you know in those 16 games, he was not. He was average to below average as opposed to DeLotter in the Cape, where he was literally the best hitter in the Cape last year. I mean, one can make a case. He was the best hitter in the Cape last season, and he just continued to perform very well. 
He also pitched a little bit at James Madison. Uh, I don't think that's something they're going to keep going forward, but he ended up uh, throwing 22 innings. That's more than uh, Reggie Crawford, who went pick 30, and uh, more than, I believe, Connor, Connor Prelip did in college, who went to the Twins. So, But, yeah, like, how good was he in the Cape? Well, how about a 290 average, 397 on base, 589 slugging, led the Cape with nine home runs, also had seven doubles and a triple. Bapip was actually kind of okay there. Uh, strikeout percentage at 12, walk percentage at 14. He was much better in the Cape than Zimmer was. He's a better athlete. He was He's young for the class. There are loud tools. He has potential plus power. I think hit tools above average to average. Some people say plus. And here's the thing. if you, it, It's hard to judge the BAPIP value with him. Yes, that is a great indicator against lower-level competition, which is what it is playing in the CAA. He didn't face the best competition. When he did, he got absolutely tortured, carved up, and destroyed by Parker Mezik, who we're going to talk about in segment three. Uh, like Literally, the guy who made him look the worst all year is who the Guardians drafted uh, in the second round. So that's uh, it's almost like they were just mocking him when they, <laughs> they drafted Parker Mezik. But... It's hard because the data is video game like, but it's limited and it's a smaller level of competition. So you rely on the Cape data, which the Guardians have done. We've seen that. There was in 2019, they were all Cape. Like a lot of those guys, we can talk like, okay, Hunter Gaddis has been on the show. Hunter actually had a down junior year. His best performance was on the Cape, and that's what they drafted him off of. And it's been a great pick. They put a lot of value in the Cape performance. And Listen, he's young for the class. He's not going to turn. Tw- he's younger than a lot of the draft eligible sophomores. Um, let's see. I guess I have to go over here and do it the other way. But you know, he is a young player. He's big. He's fast. He's strong. He's performed with wood bats. Uh, honestly, he looked like a top five pick before the year began. That, that's where it was. I, I I had him in my initial big board. I mean, I can. I believe I posted that. I believe I can pull that up and tell you that. Like he was a top five player in my uh, way, my initial big board. He was that good of a player, uh, just based on the tools and the performance and everything that was there. And then it was a disappointing season. Then he got hurt. He hurt his foot, and that's why he's there. If he's healthy and he performs, he's gone. He, he's gonna go in the top, you know, five of this draft class. But he didn't, and that's why he's there. And there's a little more risk. Yeah, he's not turning 21 until October. He's a very young junior. So you're betting on the Cape Cod. You're putting a lot of faith in those 24 games. And then, you know, he can make, there's talk that he'll play on the corner. I don't, I think he could be an adequate center fielder. Probably better in the corner. Uh, the arm is enough for right, but probably ends up in left. And he could be a plus defender in left field. And then you're betting on above average hit and above average power. I mean, there is five tool potential. The ceiling is a five tool star. The floor is Bradley Zimmer. That that's just the truth of the matter. It may not be what people want to hear. I know Zimmer was not exactly beloved in his time here, uh, but I there's better tools. He has better tools, and then both players. When Bradley Zimmer went and played at a higher level, he didn't play well. He was mediocre in the Cape. When the latter went to the Cape, he dominated. So that is what you're putting your faith in right there. We're going to take a break, come back and talk about a pair of pitchers. Uh, it, well, actually, I lied. So one thing, James uh, Madison is now the or from he's the highest player, uh, highest draft pick ever from James Madison. Uh, so that's a, a thing for him. And I also want to say I still we've talked about the top 10 prospects in the system. I don't think he breaks that list. I just I don't. He's he might be like 11, 12, 13. But it's really hard with those players that are performing so well. He'll, he'll break on MLBs. MLB will slam him in the top 10. I guarantee you. Guarantee it now. He'll, he'll be in there. And maybe after some graduations, like Nolan Jones stays up, a few other players spend more time in the majors and we get some graduations, yeah, then he'll, he might be in it by the end of the year. Uh, and if he gets healthy, I don't know what the current condition is on his foot. I should have list, should have gone to the press conference. I had the ability to zoom in. I was just wanted to stick around and cover all parts of the draft. Uh, to hear when he's going to be healthy and ready to go. But, yeah, he's a, a fascinating player. And I don't, like I said, he fits all their models. I was all over him as a potential draft pick for a reason. Uh, he's a good player. High risk, high reward. If 
you wanted them to to go for upside and ceiling, they did it with Chase to Lauder. I'm going to take that break, come back, and talk about the pair of lower ceiling pitchers, but still really interesting prospects. Through this whole process, I've been relying on Bet Online to get my information on draft odds because when it comes to things that involve money, they're going to have all the extra time research and everything that's going. Any website that was switching their odds around, I was checking against Bet Online. They were in line with them. It is a go to. I loved not just the fact that, you know, I could see Tamar Johnson, Brooks Lee with that top overall selection, but the fact that it's like Jace, uh, Jace Young at 12 and a half. You could go through and point out and see a lot of things. I, what was the, you know, it's it's down now, but there was one I was like, oh, this is a really interesting one. Like, I would definitely bet the under here, and I was right. Like, I was like, oh, again, I had a really good piece of advice to give you in that episode. Bet online is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Find the latest sports development, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. Bet online is a continued source for all of your space sports wagering information, and it's the fastest and easiest way to check your favorite sports events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. It's a great research tool. BetOnline.net. Go check it out for yourself. So Justin Campbell was actually rumored to be in play at 16. Uh, it was just the way this draft fell out that they were lucky he was on the board for them. I had him as my 23rd rated player, I want to say. He was, again, not the highest rated player. Connor Prelip um, at that time, or Brock, no, I had him ahead of Brock Porter. But you know, he was a player that I valued much more than the 37th pick. Uh, yeah, 23rd overall player in this class. And you know, he's six foot seven, but he's not a power guy. Uh, command control, just a very Guardians type of arm. Like, if you were to go through this class, and if you go all the way back to when I did, like, my first, one of my first videos here was an Oklahoma State preview. And I was talking about that Oklahoma State program and how they had just pitching, interesting pitching for days. And when I talked about Justin Campbell, who's the most interesting pitcher in that group to me, uh, I talked about how then, you know, this is a very Guardians type of guy. Fastball, curveball, slider, changeup. You know, there's nothing that's necessarily plus, but his fastball is a spin rate pitch, which matters to the Guardians. It's more of a low 90s, has hit upper 90s, but it's the spin rate that's important. He hits his spots really well. He's a command control artist. And here's the thing I'll say that's not charitable. Oklahoma State had Justin Campbell, Bryce Osmond, who could have been a Cade Horton type of pitcher, was kind of similarly ranked a few years ago, Mitchell Stone, and Victor Medeiros, who transferred in. Four really interesting pitchers. Uh, Nolan McLean was a third baseman slash reliever for them. They might have five pitchers drafted uh, in the first two days. We didn't see a lot of development from them. Kirk Sarlouse is uh, you know, actually a pretty good coach that they have, so I don't know what's going on. But you can't help but look at Justin Campbell as a guy who you know could be there could be more there and you know just in addition he also you know was a a batter his first two years uh for them he didn't was what wasn't a hitter this year but i mean last year he had 67 at bats uh, not great numbers he was a first baseman as well but he's that two-way guy and just being able to focus on being a pitcher is going to be a big thing for him you know pitched it well at team usa has always been productive pretty much stepped in as a starter from day one for that program and then ended up with 35 starts over the last three years got better every year strikeout rate kept going up nearly 13 per nine walk rate kept going down 2.22 home run rate i believe was going up but again guardians actually seem to prefer fly ball get the ball in the air type of guys he is a pitcher, again, at six foot seven. you expect more velocity. It isn't there. He hits his spots really well. He is a Guardians type of pitcher. He is the type of guy where if they're taking him here, I think they think they can unlock more. And with what he has shown, could be a very interesting player just in that regards of he already hits his spots. He has multiple pitches. They're just not plus. He doesn't have a plus offering, really. But he's got a high spin fastball. He has been inconsistent with his velocity, and the Guardians are exactly the right team to help him be more consistent with that velocity. So I think Campbell's a great pick. Again, got to write my mock, so I'm always loving when I can get one of those correct. 
Uh, but he just he's fit them to a T, and it's much like with the latter. They stood out for months. Parker Mezik, I wasn't always sure if he was a guardian type of arm. He's an undersized guy, so kind of six foot, two forty eight. So one of the big knocks on him is conditioning. Um, he is a funky lefty. If you go and watch the tape of him versus Delotter, he makes Delotter look awful. But uh, you've also heard me when I defended Delotter say that Mezik pretty much made everybody look awful this year. Uh, four pitch mix, hits all of his spots well, missed a ton of bats. But he's, I don't know. I don't know where you expect to get growth unless it's conditioning. And I hate phrasing it that way, but he is like, you know, and he's, he's, it's just something that came up as you read reports is some people had concerns about that. Let's just put it on front street. Let's say what it is. It is what it is. Same time for a guy that people worry about that. He went deep into games. How about a strikeout per nine of 13, four, five, a walk per nine of 1.54. And oh yeah, home run rate over one as well. His went up very similar statistically to Campbell. And that's what the Guardians are looking for. Fly balls, strikeouts, limited the walks. That That's one, two, three. Line them up and move on. And you know, he was one of the best pitchers in the country this year. It, you're you're kind of hoping that he's like a, a five, right? You're hoping that he's a just an innings-eating lefty. He's, like I said, he's undersized, but he's being thicker. You think that he can hold up a little bit better at that and that he's just going to be able to mix pitches and be effective. It's one of those cases I really wish I was a little more tapped in um, and I could get some better spin rate data here. Let me check something real quick. I have an outside chance. I might be able to get something interesting on that. I want to take a second and throw a shout out to uh, at Tieran, T-I-E-R-A-N-7-1-1. He does a super in-depth uh, draft look, and this is where I went to look on Mezik because he got all the data on things like um, all the data I wish I had, <laughs> if I'm being honest, uh, in terms of like release points and spin rates and everything else. And the thing really, as I look at Mezik and look at his additional great just I mean, data that is fun to look at, you know, it's the slider and the change are both solid. He is going to be those are the set pitches, but the fastball just isn't there. The one thing you say about the Guardians is they're good about adding velocity. If they can help Mezik, add, he's got you know he's got a low release point, which a lot of people love as well too. If he can add some velocity, then he gets to be interesting. If he can't, he I, I don't even know if he's a reliever. It's just he's so because the velocity is that it's really what's holding him back. But there is a chance for a reliever, a chance for a starter, and he's going to the right team because if you can find. You know, if you can find a little more velocity, if you can clean a few things up with him, if you can get that stuff cleared out, then he's a potential starter. Uh, and hey, you know, it, in some respects, you could consider it a bonus for Chase that now he knows he will never have to face him because they're a part of the same system. Guardians need to add Bryce Hubbard tomorrow and just com- completely, you know, take those demons away from Chase's mind. It's a Campbell is probably like back into the teens. Mezik, I don't know if he cracks the top thirty for me just because uh, you got to see him. I, he's just currently he's not a future major leaguer without that velocity gain to me. Um, I mean, potentially could be, but it's just it's a harder path. It's not a bad pick. Second rounder, I mean, almost all of them you could say something similar about. Uh, I think it is, it's really interesting. I had, you know, a top 51 this year, 49 of those players taken. The only two guys left, I think I might have mentioned this already, Trey Dombrowski from Monmouth, who keep an eye on for tomorrow. I could really see him being a Guardians target in day three and round three in day two. Uh, and Brock Porter, they don't. They probably save some money of pick one. Uh, Campbell is probably around slot, and I bet Mezik's a little underslot, so they do have some money to play with, but they don't have Brock Porter money. Uh, the, and the, the other thing I do want to say, the catcher group is really good in this year's class. Uh, the Dodgers, of course, took Dalton rushing because why do they always get the good catchers? But you still have, like, Kate Hunter left, who's really interesting. Um, Hayden Dunhurst, who's a good defensive catcher. Uh, Brady Neal is an interesting prep guy. Uh, I would not be surprised to see them come back. We've seen quite a few go off the board, but I think there's still room. And this is it's an organizational depth issue at that position. I have been Jeff Ellis. This has been the Locked on Guardians podcast. Remember to rate and review, download daily. It helps. I hope I helped make the draft a little less dense, a little more understandable, and helped you get a little excited for three interesting players being added to the Guardian system. All three have a chance to contribute, and one has a chance to be a centerpiece of the Cleveland Guardians minor league system. And as I end every show now, go, go, Guardians, go.